Well, thank you, everyone, for being with us here for this session. This is a really, really important session right now. Ukraine's fight for freedom, Russian aggression, and the future of NATO. It couldn't come at a more important time. And I want to welcome Senator Joni Ernst of the great state of Iowa. She is on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Honorable Christine Warmuth, Secretary of the Army. General Chance Saltzman, call sign Salty. He's the new head of the US Space Force, and this is the first time he will be speaking publicly since taking on that very important role. And Greg Hayes, CEO and chairman of Raytheon. Raytheon, of course, the Javelin missiles at the start of the Ukraine conflict. We saw the damage that they did and how they sent the Russians back from Kyiv away from the target that they had wanted, the, the capital. So we've all been watching. The, you could say that the Javelins were the MVP of the early weeks of this conflict. Maybe co-MVP with the Stinger. <laughs> with the Stinger as well, also made by Raytheon. <laughs> And I don't work for Raytheon. <laughs> um, so we're coming to this discussion at a key m inflection point. You have a new Congress coming in, Republicans indicating that they may curtail support for Ukraine, cut back some of the funding. You have winter that has come. You've got the Russians that have been forced to retreat from key locations like Kherson. The Ukrainians still have the will to fight. They've outlasted anyone's expectations. You've got reports of US weapon stockpiles that are strained, that they may not be able to continue at the pace. They're having to go around and, and find allies who can provide some of the weapons because it takes so long to get these uh, weapons manufactured. You have a frustrated industry that would like the Pentagon to move faster. You have a frustrated Pentagon that would like industry to move faster. You have NATO, the NATO alliance being tested like it hasn't been ever before. So we'll talk about the way ahead in Ukraine, how this war likely ends, and, and what we can do to make the outcome uh, so that the Ukrainians can win. Senator Ernst, I'll start with you. We're here at the Ronald Reagan Defense Forum at the Reagan Library. Ronald Reagan was very clear-eyed when it came to the Soviets and the threat of the Soviet Union. He passed huge defense budgets. He was aggressive in where he placed those weapons. He understood that Soviet expansionism had to be stopped. Vladimir Putin is acting very much like a Soviet leader. He's trying to erase the, the outline of the map of Europe. Why do so many Republicans seem to be rejecting Reagan's core beliefs today and embracing this neo-isolationism that we're seeing? I think we have seen this through a number of iterations, different administrations, not just Republican administrations, but turning more inward rather than focusing outward. And Reagan, of course, we know the, the famous phrase, peace through strength. That's what we need to continue to build upon. I think it's important for Republicans just to understand that if we are not engaged in a presence around the globe, if we are not pushing back on Vladimir Putin and Russia, uh, that they will continue to expand. They may not stop with Ukraine. And do we want to live in a world that is dominated by China and Russia? That would be the, the key question there. And I think the answer that Republicans would have is that, no, we don't want to live in that type of world. So let's continue to press. Let's help the Ukrainians make sure that they're defeating the Russians. But do you think that House Republicans will cut aid to Ukraine? And have you discussed this with uh, Kevin McCarthy? There, I have not spoken directly to Kevin McCarthy, but I have spoken to a number of other House Republicans that believe very firmly we should be supporting the Ukrainians. We should be promoting peace through strength. Unfortunately, we're beyond that point now with Ukraine. Um, but we need to continue to arm them so that they can win this fight, deter the Russians in the future. General Saltzman, you were the first general officer to be promoted to the newly formed Space Force. You were a missile officer. You were an expert with the Minuteman III. You were the operations officer during, in 2007 during the Chinese anti-satellite test, which shocked the Pentagon, shocked the national security establishment. Take us behind the scenes during that test, what you learned and what, how you're applying it 
in Ukraine? How is Space Force involved in Ukraine? Well, thank you, Jennifer. I, I think back on that time quite often, in fact. Uh, 2007, I was Chief uh, of Combat Operations on the, in the Joint Space Operations Center at the time. Um, and we had some insights that this test was going to occur, but we really couldn't bring ourselves to believe that in 2007, somebody would create a destructive event on orbit because we had all come to understand the value that space was bringing to not just military, but economies around the world and, and people in general. Um, when that event occurred, I, I think it was a bell ringer uh, for the Department of Defense. Uh, certainly, my time in the Air Force, it was a bell ringer. And the entire space community saw a change that, um, that I characterized as a shift to a contested domain. You know, it, it had been kind of verboten to say space and war fighting in the same sentence uh, prior to that event. Uh, and, and quite frankly, even after that event, it took a while to really cross that threshold. I think we're past that now. Uh, two things have kind of been proven out watching and observing in Ukraine. The value of space. The last panel just talked about uh, using satellite communications, the information distribution. Uh, the precision navigation and timing capabilities that space offers has demonstrated its value, so much so that both sides are engaged in trying to counter those capabilities and deny those advantages to the opponent. And, and so space is clearly a contested domain. Uh, it's really why you have a space force. We have, inside the department, elevated the discourse of space and, and the need to protect our capabilities in space um, by establishing that service, uh, the Space Force. And so I, I think this modern war that we're seeing play out in Ukraine is just indicative of what we can expect in the future. And so the Space Force is engineered to try to organize, train, equip to prevent that. But back to what you learned during the Chinese anti-satellite -sat test, you realized that China or Russia could blind the US. Explain what you saw and how you're protecting those satellites now. Well. You know, the, it takes years to develop the systems that we had put in place uh, in 2007. And uh, quite frankly, we had engineered the solution for the satellites in a way that said, listen, launch is so expensive. When we put these systems on orbit, we want to reduce the launch cost associated with the overall system. So let's launch big satellites with, that meet all these requirements, and let's do the launch as few times as possible. Well, that's not inherently resilient as soon as you have an adversary that starts to physically attack that system. If you can just take out a few satellites and radically degrade the capabilities, you don't have a resilient architecture. And so I think that was the start of the discussion, that we need to build a new type of space set of capabilities with resiliency baked in from the beginning. And that's been the transformation that we've undergone. Secretary Warmuth, what did you think of the Russian military on February 23rd? What do you think of it today? And how come you did not know these things before the war? Well, I think certainly um, what we thought of the capabilities of the Russian military the day before they invaded Ukraine and how we've seen them perform has been a pretty startling difference. Uh, I, I think the Russians themselves, frankly, have been surprised at how poorly they've performed and how poorly some of their weapon systems have performed. Uh, you know, I think we, we saw them, obviously, in Syria. Uh, you know, we've, we saw them in Chechnya and Georgia, and I think there was a view that they had some uh, pretty serious uh, military capability, but they have not been able to bring it to bear in Ukraine. Um, which is terrific, and they also, I think, you know, grossly underestimated the Ukrainians, their proficiency and their will to fight. I think a lot of what you're seeing with the Russians um, is the, the inability to really engage in combined arms warfare. Uh, and they're also, I think, very much paying the price that they don't have an NCO Corps, you know, which is, um, it's very hard to have uh, mission command when you don't have trust and you don't have a set of uh, senior NCOs who can carry out what you're trying to do. And I think they're also seeing a lot of problems with discipline as a result of their lack of an NCO core. Uh, so I do think we need to look hard uh, at, at where we think the Russian capabilities are going to be in the future, because clearly, you know, I think um, we thought they were more capable than they were. But I also wouldn't underestimate the Russians' um, ability to learn lessons from their performance and to 
rebuild. You know, our sanctions regime will make that much more difficult for the Russians to do. But if you look at their performance over time, they do learn lessons. They learned lessons from their performance in Georgia in 2008. And we shouldn't be complacent that they will not try to uh, reset and get stronger again. Greg, I remember when I was serving as a correspondent in Moscow in the late 90s, and it was revealed that during the Cold War, that those parades that showed those missiles going across Red Square, they were actually balloons, some of them. Some of them weren't actually even missiles. And we were counting them one by one like missiles. As a weapons manufacturer, what do you see in terms of the Russian military? Was this an intelligence failure? Was this, what are you seeing in terms of their weapons stockpiles? And um, are we overestimating Russia's strength and ability to come back? And are we overestimating China's strength? Two very different answers, I think. Uh, if you think about the Russian military, and I think uh, Secretary Ormus said it very well, the fact is we understood the capabilities in terms of what s systems they had, what stockpiles they had, and how they could deliver them. Where we misunderstood, I think, was their ability to execute. We also, I think, have so far degraded their ability to rebuild their war stocks that we're not going to be facing the same type of a Russian threat three years from now that we were a year ago. But clearly, uh, the Russians have incredible capabilities, uh, but they also have some incredible difficulties in terms of their precision weapons, not very precise, which is, again, something as we evaluate strategically you know, what the enemy has, when we look at precision weapons, I would tell you that the Chinese are far, far ahead of where the Russians are, and we, I think, are slightly ahead of where the Chinese are today. But clearly, it's something that we need to be focused on is the capabilities of the Chinese are, are increasing every single day. Hypersonics is probably the best example, where we, are, we still have to catch up. And General Saltzman, that brings me to space, because you've said that space makes the US military more precise. Explain how, you, how Space Force comes in in terms of precision weaponry and why the Russians might be suffering, but the US is learning from what they're seeing in Ukraine. Yeah, we're, you know, I hesitate to use the word indispensable, but it, it, it does kind of feel like that sometimes because I've watched in the Pentagon over the years, the force structure that we've put in place for all the services uh, counts on the fact that there will be space capabilities contributing to it. Uh, whether it's with precision munitions enabled by the GPS constellation, whether it's over the horizon satellite communications, whether it's the indications and warning provided by ISR on orbit or missile warning, et cetera. It, we've built our force structure assuming we would have access to those capabilities. So now we have to make sure that we will continue to have access to those capabilities. And, and I just want to highlight something the secretary said because I think it's so important. Um, if we think we can just buy the best arsenal, we are going to have half of the equation met. It's that we, of course, you're probably not going to be successful in modern warfare unless you have high-tech weaponry. I, I, and, and this group knows this better than, than most. Um, but it's the tactics, it's the training, it's the experience, it's the joint interoperability, it's the ability to work hand in glove with allies and partners. That takes a lot of time and energy and a different kind of set of tools, tools whether it's simulators or, or range activities with exercises, all of that is critical to turning an arsenal into a military force. I think we're observing that in Ukraine and from a space standpoint, I'm looking at the transition from a benign space environment to one that's contested and I know that both sides of those equations have to be true. Greg, let's talk about the javelins and these anti-tank missiles that were so decisive. You've said that the DOD has not bought a Javelin or a Stinger since 2002, and now they want 10,000 of them. <laughs> so, so just How to, did that happen? So just to be clear, the, the Stinger uh, was developed in 1977. It went into service in 1982, and it was, a, it was procured by DOD. Our last contract was in 2002. Um, the Stinger was incredibly effective in Afghanistan with the Mujahideen. Uh, it's been incredibly effective, even though the technology is 50 years old. Um, the Javelin is actually, it's a little bit different story. The Javelin has been in continuous production. We're actually on the fourth lot. And we, working with Lockheed Martin, our partner on, on Javelin, have been able to continue to update that. And we're actually building those at a rate of about 400 a month. The problem is we have consumed so much supply in the first 10 months of the war, 
we've essentially used up 13 years worth of uh, stinger production and five years worth of javelin production. So the question is, how are we going to resupply, restock uh, the inventories? Secretary Warmworth, are you concerned that the stockpiles are getting low? What are you seeing from your perch? Well, I think, you know, it's really important to focus on the fact that actually, you know, thanks to Congress and the tremendous support that they've given through the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative and the supplementals, we've actually pushed $6 billion worth of contracts out to industry to help us with replenishment, you know, which is going to, I think, enable us to not only continue to supply Ukraine, but also to replenish our own stocks. So, you know, just in the last month, for example, we've um, given contracts to Raytheon for six batteries of NASAMs. Uh, we've also given you contracts for Excalibur. We've put out contracts to General Dynamics, IMT Defense, and one other company to um, increase production of 155 millimeter ammo, which has been critical to the Ukrainians. So I think you know, we've really been working closely with industry to both increase their capacity and also the speed at which they're able to produce. And we're trying to work with industry to the point Greg made um, to the extent that there are particular components that are sort of choke points, if you will. We're trying to help with sourcing those to try to be able to move things more quickly. Uh, so I think um, certainly we all would like to have greater stockpiles than we had in the last you know, several years. The Army, I think, saw this coming a little bit, and we had been investing more in our ammunition stocks even before the Russians went into Ukraine. But I do think we've done a lot to put money on contract with industry to increase production of these systems. You know, whether it's, we also did, just did a, a $430 million contract to Lockheed Martin for HIMARS. Um, so, you know, we're, we're working on it, and I think we're, we're going to ramp up. And we've also, you know, spent a lot of time with our NATO uh, counterparts. Bill LaPlante has met with the armaments directors at NATO to get the Europeans to increase their production. I mean, we shouldn't have to do this by ourselves. Can I just give a shout out to, I think, to uh, Secretary Warmoth's point? President Biden made a decision in July to put NASAM systems into Ukraine. We went to the Pentagon uh, within three or four weeks. We sat down with uh, Bill the Plant, and uh, I think Doug uh, was there, Doug Bush. Who the great was, Doug Bush. The great Doug Bush. And he, he took it upon himself to say, we're going to get this done in 30 days. And a procurement process is typically a six-month process, right? You go through all of the paperwork and the cost and pricing data. And Doug cut through all of that. And we, in 30 days, we had a contract for the first two NASAM systems. They were delivered three weeks later. They're in country. They're hugely effective. And I would say, we, we have found ways to cut bureaucracy that I never thought was possible. So really a shout out to, to LaPlante and, and to Doug and to the Secretary Wormuth for everything that you guys have done, because we can, we can do this. But let me follow up on the NASAMs, this advanced air defense system that Ukraine needs to defend itself from the incoming long-range uh, missiles, the standoff weapons that Russia's firing. It's great that you cut through the bureaucracy for those two NASAM systems, but now they want eight more, and it takes two years to build that air defense system. And now explain what you're having to do to go around to allies and what the Pentagon has come up with as a solution. But it is a little unnerving to think that you can't, and then it takes six months of training for the uh, Ukrainians to use the advanced air defense system. So explain how that works. Well, keep, so keep in mind, the NASAMS is something we're in joint production with, with um, the Norwegians, and it does take time. We have not had it in current production for a while. The fact is we have delivered a number of these systems uh, to some countries in, in Europe and the Middle East, and it's different than the Patriot. The Patriot, we make one Patriot system every single month in our factories in Andover, Massachusetts. Great system, but it's in, in regular production. With NASAMs, we're going to have to ramp up production really from, from, from zero here. The good news is there are systems that are deployable. I'll defer to uh, the Secretary to talk about what we're doing, but we, we do have options. Secretary. And I would also point out, you know, not only do we have options, uh, and we've, you know, we've given the Ukrainians Avenger, we also, just at the last uh, Ukraine working group, several of our NATO allies made commitments to provide systems that they have. So I think you know, you're going to see the Spanish uh, giving air defense systems, a couple of other NATO members, and, and some other uh, allies and partners around the world. So I think, again, 
you know, we are uh, trying to do everything we can, but we're also, you know, part of an alliance that's all in on this. And I think our, our allies and partners can help us with some of these systems. And I would also say, you know, I've been really pleased that, you know, the Norwegians have helped with um, the NASAMS training. In many cases, we've been really compressing the training programs. Uh, you know, my understanding is traditionally training for uh, NASAMS is, you know, several months, and we've shrunk it down to about a month. So that's something else. That's another variable, if you will, that we can adjust. Senator Ernst, how concerned are you about these dwindling stockpiles, and are you worried about what it means in terms of if something were to happen in Taiwan? What are you seeing from your situation. And what I hear from constituents, they, they do bring this up, and, and we as members of Congress are concerned about that. But fact of the matter is we need to continue supporting in whatever manner we can and encouraging uh, our defense industrial base to continue to develop um, systems to procure them, even use from allies and friends. Um, I think that there are many options available to us. But again, going back to the, the point that we need to continue to support Ukraine, very, very important. There are other measures that we can bring forward. Um, one proposal that I have has been to employ the Gray Eagle uh, in Ukraine. This we, is a drone. Explain this, the Gray Eagle. And this is an unmanned aerial vehicle uh, to gain air superiority over the skies of Ukraine. We know that the Iranians are outfitting the Russians with their own drones. And so we can overmatch in this area, and I think it's very important. So there's a bipartisan push in Congress to do this. We have excess capability in uh, our supply without pulling away from Indo-PACOM or CENTCOM. So we can employ this capability, and it will give us the ability uh, to, to maintain a dominance over the eastern part of Ukraine, very important. But the Biden administration doesn't want to provide the Gray Eagle, and you've written a letter to them, a bipartisan letter yeah. with Joe Manchin. What's the response, and why don't they want to provide these drones that could fire four hell fires at the same time and are so well, lethal? Well, we, we have various pushback coming from the Biden administration, but I, I will go back to the, the fact that we do have excess capability here. This is something that we can employ right now, today. Uh, we export this technology to other countries. We can certainly use it in Ukraine. I think it is the smart thing to do at a time when the Ukrainians need it. General Saltzman, talk about the Starlink and Elon Musk's Starlink, how crucial it's been there. Why doesn't the U.S. and the Pentagon have a Starlink system that they can provide to Ukraine? Why so dependent on uh, one individual like Elon Musk? Well, we do have a Starlink. It's just owned by Elon Musk, I, I, <laughs> which is a little cheaper for us. So I, I think that's all goodness. I, listen, um, again, back to the value of space capability. I, I think that's been shown in, in clear terms here. Um, commercial augmentation of what is traditionally military capability also proving its worth. Uh, therefore, we have to be able to think through how do we make things more resilient now, knowing that the full resilient architecture through the, the acquisition process takes a little time to put in place. So how are we getting more resilient now? Well, commercial augmentation is definitely one of those avenues that we're approaching. Out at Space Systems Command, we've established the Commercial Services Office to lower the threshold. It's kind of a front door to help industry come in and show us where they have ideas, where they have capabilities that can help us build resiliency now through commercial augmentation. Starlink is just one of those examples. It seems like on the battlefield that this, you could save yourself 10 years of R&D by allowing Silicon Valley and some of the, the uh, defense contractors who have, uh, have weapons that are ready to t be tested but haven't been fully tested. What needs to happen to cut through the red tape to get those weapons on the battlefield and to use this opportunity in Ukraine as an R&D advancement for the U.S. military. Secretary Warmuth? I would say, I mean, I've been very pleased, frankly, since becoming Secretary of the Army about a year and a half ago at how much faster we are acquiring and developing systems and how much more closely we're working with industry, not just our big primes, but also some of the, you know, Silicon Valley companies. And, you know, one, Congress has been giving us a number of different authorities that allow us to move more quickly, and I think that's been very helpful. 
Another thing the Army has done is we, um, we established Army Futures Command in Austin, Texas in 2018, and one of the things that we have under, under AFC is something we call the Army Applications Lab. And this is actually a group that is specifically charged with working with Silicon Valley, working with startup, working with small companies that don't normally work with the Army, and helping them figure out, you know, frankly, how to get into our acquisition system. And we've been able to do some pretty interesting things through that mechanism. So I think, you know, you're always going to have um, more requirements, if you will, and more hurdles to go through, um, you know, when you're building something for the U.S. military that has to be safe, that has to work. Um, but I think we have sped up our processes um, in a pretty significant manner. Can, can I yes, real please. quick piggyback on that? Because I think it's a very important point that the Secretary is making. In our, in our business where we organize, train, and equip, uh, we're talking right now about some tactical decisions, like near-term realities that we have to manage and we have to help out however we can. But our job is really to think in longer terms. How do we set the stage so that when we need to go fast, we'll be able to go faster? There's, whether it's policy shifts, whether it's setting up infrastructure, interoperability standards, so that when we pull capabilities in, we can test and develop and integrate it faster. These are the long lead items that we do now before we get into those tactical decisions because your decision space is so much more constrained in the tactical environment. Our job is to make sure that we've cut through the red tape beforehand. Uh, we've put the infrastructure in place to make us go faster, allow us to go faster. Uh, supply chain security, those are the things we need to be thinking about now, I think, that gets us maybe out of the, the tactical realm uh, and into more of the organized, trained, equipped for the long term. Greg, what are you seeing so from if, the if industry? If I might, too. So yeah. we have incredible capability that has yet to be deployed in Ukraine, and that is really a political decision, not a military decision. I'm thinking high energy lasers that can shoot down drones you know, very, very quickly, very, very effectively. We've demonstrated this many times. We have high energy microwave loitering munitions that can also take out drones. We have the Patriot uh, anti-air, anti-missile system. We've got a lot of capabilities. And the question is, at what point are we going to be comfortable enough to put this capability into Ukraine that's not going to escalate the conflict with the Russians? And I think that's a, there's a political decision. It's not a military, it's not a capability decision. And it's, again, we stand ready to, to take any step we can to, to help, and we're just waiting, I think, for the signal. And Yes, and Jennifer, I'd like to add to that as well, because I have had industry leaders that will come into my office and they will say, listen, you give us the set of problems to address. We, on our dime, will develop, develop those capabilities if you will employ them in Ukraine. Uh, they said, we can do whatever in 90 days. So we have to take a lesson from that as well. We have industry that wants to move quickly. They want to develop, sometimes on their own dime, not the taxpayer's dime. Why would we not take advantage of that in a time like this? Secretary Warmuth. You're representing the administration here. Is the goal to win in Ukraine or to make sure simply that Ukraine doesn't lose? Does the US want to win in Ukraine? I think what the US wants to do is to put the Ukrainians in the strongest possible position to be able to defend their sovereignty and um, you know, be able to engage with the Russians from a position of strength. So, you know, we, we are looking, it is, it, you know, given what is at stake, I think, in Ukraine, not just for the Ukrainians, but for NATO and, frankly, for the entire free world, it's in our interest to give them what they need to defend their territory and push the Russians out. And so we are looking, you know, each of the requests they make, whether it's for Grey Eagle, whether it's for Patriot, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not in the situation room anymore. You know, my job as a service secretary is to man, train, and equip and provide ready forces. But I think, you know, we are looking very carefully at uh, things like survivability. You know, is a system like, like Gray Eagle, for example, going to survive in the very contested air environment that you have with the kinds of Russian capabilities? You know, is it, um, we've got to look at things like tech transfer. I think there are, you know, sometimes very legitimate concerns about what happens if a system is shot down and gets into the hands of the Russians. Uh, we've got to look at how quickly, how available is it? How quickly can we get the, uh, the Ukrainians trained on it? A system like Patriot is, you know, not uncomplicated. I've gone out and seen my own uh, Patriot um, batteries and, 
You know, those are pretty complex systems, but I think we want to put the, the Ukrainians in the position of, of strength where they have leverage so that they can take the political decisions about where they think they need to go next. If I can yes, jump please. in as well. Please. So, and, and this is from our political standpoint, and I know a, a number of wonderful senators, um, Roger Wicker is here, thank you. He's been a great supporter of Ukraine as well. When we're looking at these sets of problems and the type of capabilities that we can employ in Ukraine, there are challenges, whether it's the survivability survivability of the Great Eagle, but certainly if we're in a contested environment like that and they're using the S-300 to shoot down a Great Eagle, that allows us then to target those S-300s. That's an incredible advantage for us. And as far as the technology, again, we can outfit a Great Eagle with technology that's already being used in 30 other countries. So I think there's, there's a push and pull between the administration and Congress and trying to get the Ukrainians what they need, not just to match the Russians, but to overmatch the Russians. And I have had this stance for a very long time that, for heaven's sake, we should be pounding the bloody hell out of the Russians through the Ukrainians so that they can't pop their head back up and come back in another five to 10 years. That's my stance. And I think so many of us feel very strongly about this. If we're not helping the Ukrainians win and win decisively, what happens next with Taiwan? What happens next in another hot spot around the world? America has to regain its leadership and we have to be very firm in that commitment. Let's go to the poll slide from the survey that deals with NATO and views of NATO because the findings were pretty interesting and, and maybe surprising to some political leaders in terms of how much public support there is actually for NATO right now. So if you have that slide, uh, it's, it, the question was about the views on NATO, and there was a 60% favorable rating in the new Reagan National Defense Survey. Finland and Sweden joining NATO, 71% approval. Support for US responding with military force if Russia attacks NATO ally in Europe, 72%. And Ukraine has applied for NATO membership, 61% support uh, uh, NATO membership for Ukraine. What do these, what does this polling tell you, especially when you start, when you hear about talk of withdrawing support for this effort in, um, uh, in Ukraine? What, what does this tell you, S Senator? I think there is a very loud minority. I think that most Americans believe in what we are doing because they see the value in freedom. They understand that. But there are a few talking heads out there that are very loud in their message. And it goes back to this culture of angertainment that's out there. I heard that from Kat Kamek the other day. She's great. Um, so Kat had said that word, angertainment. And it really stirs an invokes an emotion in certain people, but the vast majority of Americans and our American public see value. They just want to know that we as a Congress and as an administration are watching those taxpayer dollars, using them judiciously, and making sure that we are promoting freedom and our values where we can with democracies that exist around the globe. Secretary Warmuth, put into context the amount of money that's being spent and sent to Ukraine right now and how much that is compared to fighting a war later. That's a, that's a great way to frame it, frankly. Um, you know, like I said, Congress has given uh, the administration um, several billion dollars. As I said, you know, we've already pushed six billion dollars out to industry and I think, and there's a whole additional um, you know, amount of money that's been given for humanitarian aid. So you know, we are investing, obviously, a tremendous amount in supporting the Ukrainians. But I think it is, you know, um, this is a case where we are avoiding being penny wise and pound foolish. You know, we have got to stop Russia there, uh, and it is very much in our interest. You know, if this were, if this were, were to widen, and you know that is certainly a concern that that everyone has been um, paying attention to. And you know, with the the explosion in Poland just over the Ukrainian border recently, I think that 
put a fine point on the possibility of you know, how this could turn into a war with NATO, that would be unbelievably costly. I mean, you know, just look at the humanitarian outflows of refugees leaving Ukraine and the strain that that's put on the European economy. So, you know, I would certainly make the argument to any American that the money that Congress has given us to provide material support to the Ukrainians is incredibly well spent in terms of American security. And what would have happened, Secretary Wormuth, if uh, President Trump wanted to pull all U.S. troops out of Germany? What would have happened if Russia invaded Ukraine and all U.S. troops had been pulled out of Germany? Well, I think it would have been much, much harder, obviously, for, I mean, A, I think that, you know, would have been um, even more of an invitation for Russian aggression and for Russians to be, um, to overstep. But uh, it would have made it much harder for us to respond as quickly as we did and to be able to reassure our NATO allies, you know, in Poland, in the Baltic republics. I mean, because of investments we have made in army preposition stocks in Europe, uh, we were able to send a um, brigade combat team, an armored brigade combat team, to Germany in a week. And they were able to draw their equipment out and you know, go into the eastern flank. It would have been much, much harder to do that had we not uh, had the kind of footprint in Europe uh, that we have today, and which has, frankly, you know, grown. I mean, we now have uh, um, 100,000 US uh, military personnel in Europe right now, almost half of which are army troops. Um, so our, our posture in Europe has obviously become more robust since the invasion. Jennifer, if I could, the, um, the numbers on the poll, I think, also indicate that there's broad public support for honoring our commitments to allies. Uh, and that if we're going to engage militarily, doing it with a group of allies is a more positive effect. Uh, it is a real asymmetric advantage that, that the United States has, that we can draw a coalition together, that we can build allies and partners of like-minded nations to attack aggression, to, to deter this kind of activities. And you've just set up a NATO space force or space command in Europe. Um, why was that necessary? How revolutionary is that, and what will it be used for? Well, uh, the NATO partners, uh, many of them are recognized the importance of space the, the way the United States did, and they've all grown uh, varying levels of, of space capabilities. What you're talking about, about a year ago, I visited uh, Ramstein Air Force Base, where NATO has established a space air op center, a space center, uh, op center. And uh, when I was there, it was very nascent. Uh, it, was, it was a few rooms. Uh, a few computers, a few uh, international officers getting together, collaborating. Uh, it is now really a nexus of information sharing, of figuring out how to integrate space capabilities into uh, NATO to strengthen it, to, to leverage capabilities more uh, adequately. So, is that because you're concerned about cyber attacks, the increase in cyber attacks in Europe? I think it's more because the value of space and cyber is known uh, as a force multiplier across the entire allied force. Uh, and because of its importance, we have to take it seriously. We have to be talking about it. We have to be doing all the groundwork, uh, lay the foundation so that we can be effective if we're called on to use it. And what did you see on the eve of the invasion of Ukraine in terms of cyber attacks? What, what was happening? I uh, just got to sit through uh, the, the last panel and hear General Nakasone talk about uh, the fact that they, there were concerns about the vulnerability of the, the networks in Ukraine. Uh, but with some attention given to it, with some planning, with some, with some defensive efforts, they were able to basically mitigate, by and large, the net effects that, that any cyber attacks could have. And so this is something that we can mitigate. This is something we can defend. This is not a problem set that's, that's unsolvable. We just have to dedicate the resources, build the policy structures, uh, and, and put the resources against it. Let's go to some of the questions. We have a few minutes left um, from the audience. How should the United States respond to countries assisting Russia with its invasion? Senator Ernst? Say the question. Uh, how should the United States respond to countries assisting Russia with its invasion? Well, uh, there are a number of ways that we can be assisting. Uh, but the point is there are other countries 
assisting. And so many Americans get lost in what we're providing from Congress through the DOD that we do forget there are other countries that have really stepped up to the plate to deliver. Uh, the UK is one of our greatest partners in this effort. Of course, Poland has taken in so many of those uh, 10 to you know, 15 million people that are displaced within Ukraine. Many of them have flowed into Poland and they have taken those folks on um, as their responsibility. Uh, but we can also assist through the regular aid that is flowing out of the United States. I do have some concerns with the humanitarian aid that we are providing to Ukraine. The dollars that we have contributed, the United States has given about $10 billion uh, for humanitarian purposes. Over 70% of that $10 billion has gone to the United Nations and the aid is flowing out through the United Nations. But folks, Russia sits on six of the eight executive boards of the committees that are involved with humanitarian aid. So that means Russia actually has a say in where some of that aid is going. So we need to focus on making sure that any aid that is coming from the United States is not being determined by Russia where it goes. Let's focus less on sending those dollars to the UN and use folks like USAID or just make sure that the dollars are going directly to those contributors, those vetted American partners that are serving in Europe and Ukraine. Greg, right now, Russia is relying on North Korea and Iran for their weapons supply. What more could the U.S. be doing to make sure they can't rebuild any of these long-range missiles, these advanced weapon systems? What, what more should Congress be doing to, and the administration be doing with regards to sanctions? You know, there's very little leverage we have against the North Koreans or the Iranians, obviously, at this point. Um, I think the best thing that we can do is, is continue to enforce very forcefully, the sanctions, especially on high technology, chips, I think, is, is most important. I mean, modern warfare is going to be based on silicon chips. And the fact is, Russia does not have the capabilities necessary to actually rebuild their inventory without Western or Asian, be it Chinese or Taiwanese chips. I think we have to continue to put pressure on the Chinese not to support uh, the, uh, the Russians. And you know, so far, I, I would say that their response has been better than I would have expected, given you know, the, the, uh, the alignment they've, between the two. They've pretty much stayed out of it, haven't they, despite some training exercises. They really have. President think, Xi's watching very carefully. But I think, again, enforcement of the sanctions, it has to be paramount. And we cannot allow the Russians to rearm. And I think that will degrade. Absolutely. There's a recent report by the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies on Amer uh, this is an American research firm, that said, in a war with China, the U.S. Air Force would run out of advanced long-range munitions in less than two weeks. Greg, why is the most powerful nation on Earth so short on precision-guided missiles? <laughs> uh, well, there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, part of it is supply chain. Part of it is the fact that we, uh, we spend a lot of money on some very exquisite large systems, and we do not spend or, or focus as much on the munitions necessary to support those. Um, I think if you were to talk to uh, Admiral Aquilino, who is uh, Indo-PACOM, he would tell you he needs more of everything, whether it's SM6s or SM3s or AMRAMs. And the fact is we have not had a priority on fulfilling the, uh, the, the, the war reserves that we need to fight a, a long-term battle. And I think, you know, that's, it's something that we're, we're talking to the, the Poles who just bought F-35s. And they, they bought only enough missiles for about a two-week campaign. And every one of these of our allies that are buying F-35s, exquisite systems, great engines, we make the engines, Lockheed makes the, the aircraft, but nobody's buying the weapon systems necessary to engage for anything other than a very, very short-term battle. And I think if anything the Ukraine situation has taught us is we need depth in our uh, supply chain, we need depth in our war reserves, mo much more than we had ever expected, and we need to get it out into the theater. And I think, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, Secretary Warmoth talked about the ability to, to arm the Europeans. We need to do the same in Indo-PACOM. And Secretary Warmoth, if you could restart, erase the procurement process, rebuild it, and start over, what would, how would you make this more efficient? There you go. Oh, 
It's like, can I phone a friend, Doug Bush? <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, frankly, um, I, there have been so many blue ribbon panels that have looked at acquisition reform over the years. You know, uh, I have lost track of them. But um, I, I think, you know, we can always look at our, our milestone process and see if we can simplify that. You know, again, I think there, Congress has given us a, a couple of new authorities that have been very, very helpful. Um, but, you know, I think one of, the, so one of the things I think that we could be doing that we are starting to do in the Army is just have a much more iterative cycle with industry where, you know, one thing that the department and certainly the Army has done for many, 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 many years that we are no longer doing is coming out with a requirements document for a system that is, you know, 500 pages thick doing that kind of inside of our tent and then throwing it over the transom to industry and saying, okay, figure out how you can build this. You know, now we're much more um, in a partnership and in a dialogue where there's back and forth in that requirements conceptual development. And I think that is speeding up the process. Uh, so I'm sure there are other things that could be done um, but the fact of the matter is, you know, um, in government and industry, we don't have the luxury of wiping the slate clean. We are where we are, and we have to sort of work from where we are. You know, if I just might add to that, I think two, two things that would be very helpful. One is multi-year procurement, and it's a very difficult thing to do because appropriations are done annually. But the fact is we know we're going to build 10,000 stingers. We're going to build 10,000 more javelins. All I need is someone to say, yes, we're going to buy it. Build, we're going to buy them if you build them. And let's get on a multi-year for five or six or seven or eight years. We can drive the cost down. We can get the supply chain uh, committed to invest what they need. But that's not the way the acquisition system works. Everything is annual buys. And so I think that's the, the first step is thinking about how do we do multi-year? And then also, how do we aggregate demand between the U.S. and NATO? And again, the, the NATO countries, they, they need the same uh, weapons systems, the same missiles. At the U.S., it's all about interoperability. But to be able to get all of that demand signal in one place and we can say, okay, not, not, we don't need 10,000 javelins, we need 20,000 javelins. That's a very different investment profile. But we just don't have a system today that allows us to do that. But if I'm not mistaken, I think that there is a multi-year procurement authority in the current NDAA that's pending. Um, pending. And I think you know, that, would be, um, that would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. no. And, and thanks for that point. It's very important we get an NDAA done this year. So we are, yes, <laughs> this year, this year. Why is it always down to the wire for this <laughs> NDAA? That's a, a great question. I, that, <laughs> that's a really great question. So, you know, that the House had the NDAA done earlier this year. The Senate, we had our committee work done and ready to go onto the floor earlier this summer, and yet it has languished. Um, and I am not sure. I think this is a great question for Majority Leader Chuck Schumer on why we have waited until the very end of the year to do one of our most important, important pieces of work in Congress. It always seems like the defense budget is held hostage at the end of the year. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have a couple minutes left. I'd like to go down the panel for final thoughts, but also to throw out there, is it realistic, a realistic goal for Ukraine to fully reclaim all territory, including Crimea, what's at stake? Secretary? Well, again, I think what's at stake is, um, you know, is the liberal, you know, world order and the, the concept of freedom and territorial sovereignty. And, you know, we just can't stand by and let a situation take place where an authoritarian power arbitrarily decides that a country doesn't really exist and go in and violate its borders by force. So I think the stakes are, are very, very high. And again, I think you know, what we're focused on, the administration, Congress, is giving, Ukrainian, uh, giving Ukraine you know, all that we can give them to make them as well positioned as possible to push the Russians out and to be able to leverage from a position of strength. That's really what we're focused on. General Saltzman? Hard to say it any better than the Secretary just said it. You know, I, we're in an era of great power competition where these conflicts matter on the broader scale, as the Secretary mentioned, uh, it, where it's a fight for a narrative. It's a narrative to maintain a rules-based order. It's a narrative that says stability on the global scale matters. 
uh, that aggression can't be tolerated because of its destabilizing effect on any number of human endeavors. Uh, and so these seemingly far off conflicts matter because all of these activities are so intertwined and all of these nations are so intertwined that we can't afford to just sit back and let it happen. Greg? Yeah, I think, you know, President Reagan said it 40 years ago. We, you know, we will have peace through strength. And defending democracy against autocracy is not easy. Uh, it's not just national treasure. It's also the mindset of the American public that we have to wrap our mind around. We are the arsenal of democracy. We are the defender of democracy around the world. And we have to take that seriously. And I think we have to take the lessons from Ukraine, which are many, and integrate that into our thinking for the next decade. Senator? Absolutely. Uh, this is a, a tipping point on uh, the resolve of the American people and how far we want to go in, in defending freedom. Certainly, I'm not advocating for putting our, our military men and women on the ground in Ukraine, but I do think it's imperative that we are supporting the Ukrainian people and that we are defending sovereign nations around the globe that are democracies and good partners to us. Um, so I think it's very important that we continue this fight, enabling this fight, and uh, to the point, peace through strength, and also in this, in this wonderful venue that we have today in honoring Ronald Reagan. He had also pointed out that if we are not willing to engage, uh, we will see those types of regimes start to dominate around the globe. And really, is that the kind of world we want to live in? And lastly, what about those who say they want to focus on China? They really think China's the real threat and we're spending too much money in Ukraine, too much effort in Ukraine. What would you say to those people who want to focus on China now? We can walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> and we have incredible military leaders that will do a very delicate balancing act and we will employ and deploy where we need to to maintain peace. And of course, President Xi is watching. Yes. Thank Hello. you, panel. Thank you very much. <laughs> and listening. And listening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.